Uh, I tell this story in the Gutenberg parenthesis about when print, as a medium, uh, found itself with its first competitor, radio. And newspapers particularly were most inhospitable. At first they thought radio was a cute hobby, uh, but then they realized that it could be a competitor and newspaper owners went ballistic. They forced two nascent radio networks, NBC and CBS, in deciding what was known as the Built War Agreement in 1933. And that agreement made the networks kill their news operations. They were allowed to put up news bulletins only five minutes a day after newspapers were off the press and on the street. They were to be written in a way that encouraged reading newspapers. They uh, had to buy their news from the newspaper's wire services. Commentators, get this, were not allowed to discuss news until 12 hours after it happened. And most importantly, no advertising was allowed. And that went on for a while. It fell apart first because independents, not part of the networks, didn't go along, but second because newspaper moguls realized this was a good business, so they bought radio stations, and they didn't like restrictions on themselves. But this is where we see uh, old media attack new media and try to use regulation uh, to deal with it. It's really because of newspapers lobbying to a great extent that we got the Federal Communications Commission and its predecessor agencies, and broadcast became the one medium that is sliced out of the First Amendment. Um, and so I think that's a really important context to look at what's happening as we go forward today. Uh, the same thing happened when television came along to some extent, when the R box got the ability to put up information services with the internet itself and now with AI. So we see this process going along. And what we really, what's underneath it now, the tactic that they use in, in old media is to try to expand the copyright and diminish fair use for their exclusive benefit. And so one more bit of history I think is important here to note that copyright, when it started with the Statute of Anne in 1710, did not include newspapers or magazines. When it started in the United States in 1790, it did not protect newspapers or magazines. The New York Times, in its suit against open AI, says news has always been protected by copyright. False. Simply not true. It was not until 1909 that copyright in the United States protected newspapers and magazines. And even then there was discussion of not protecting news because it was more of a corporate good than something that was, was created otherwise. So this matters today because that same tactic is being used by old media against new technology and new competitors. And we see this playing out in a few ways. There's been a raft of legislation that started in Europe with Germany's, I love saying this, Leistungsschutzrecht which is an ancillary copyright, uh, on to a Spanish link tax, on to the EU's copyright directive, on to the Australian uh, media bargaining code, on to Bill C-18 in Canada, which passed a while ago, and now legislative efforts here in Congress, in the JCPA, the Journalism uh, Competition and Protection Act. Uh, and also legislation in California, and Illinois, and elsewhere that's trying to Basically, all of these things are basically linked taxes. Um, and, and I find them dangerous for the freedoms of the internet. Um, um, sorry, I've got to remember where I was. Um, so in California right now, there's a bill called the California Journalism Preservation Act, the CJPA. Uh, I went to Sacramento two weeks ago. I'm not used to doing this. I'm an old journalist. I'm a journalism professor, I'm a blogger, I'm a podcaster, I'm not a lot of things. So I don't know how to do this. But I find myself doing it more these days. I testified before a Senate subcommittee uh, about AI and journalism a few months ago. I went to Sacramento to uh, knock on doors of legislative aides to talk about these problems. I testified before the Illinois Senate, and I just found out I'm going back to Sacramento to testify against this bill there. Because I think it's important to protect the freedoms that we have on the internet. And old media for old media's own purposes are going against them. But old media today, primarily in the United States, means corporations and hedge funds. 
California, for example, 18 of top 25 newspapers are owned by hedge funds now. They are cutting news to the marrow. They are not investing. They are not innovating. And they're trying to use legislative clout to get money. What's most frightening about the California legislation, as amended right now, is that it, it attempts to force the platforms, really just Google and Meta, to um, pay a fee for, and I use the, the legislator's word, accessing content. That is a tax on reading. That is, is noxious to the Constitution and to copyright. And, but that's what the big old media companies are doing as they lobby for this kind of legislation. So my view here is first that on the web, links have value. What the publishers try to contend is that their content is valuable, you've stolen my content, you take my headline, you've stolen my soul, and you owe me money. Well, in Canada, what happened was that Meta said, if you pass this bill, C-18, we're, we're not going to pay for news. Um, you can't make us because you have a freedom of expression principle in Canada. And we're going to pull all news off Facebook and Instagram. And they did. Meta, according to three independent studies, didn't suffer a bit of loss of traffic. But the news sites lost 30 to 50% of their traffic, which is to say that the market demonstrates that the headlines have little value to Meta, but Meta's links had tremendous value to publishers. But the value of those links was never accounted for in any of this negotiation. So first, if you're going to talk about a fair exchange of value, then I think we have to recognize that links have value. And now we get to AI. When I testified before the Senate subcommittee, it was about AI and journalism. On my right was the lobbyist for the newspaper and magazine industries. Uh, they changed their name to the News Media Alliance, but actually they go back more than 100 years with these old industries. On my left was the National Association of Broadcasters. And what they're basically saying is that AI should not be able to use for any purpose any of their copyrighted content, and all content is copyrighted these days, uh, without licensing and paper. Well, that is restriction of reading. It's restriction of learning. Uh, the Common Crawl Foundation is a wonderful organization that crawls the entire web uh, so that we all have access to it. It's been cited in 10,000 academic papers, and now along come LLMs, it's very useful to them. We have companies like the New York Times have demanded that their old content, which was freely available on the web, be taken out of the database. So what we're doing here is we're going to make the uh, LLMs, which we're all going to end up using at some point, worse and worse and worse. They will feed instead on misinformation. Now, I think that we need to have some principles at work here. And one is that if these technologies are going to be used widely, and they will be, we need them to be fed on, to be trained on quality information. And I believe that training the models is fair use and transformative. Uh, that it is used to basically teach the model how to speak. And it can, it's pretty damn amazing that it can. So I think it's important that we have models that are quality models that are as reliable as they can be and not just trained on disinformation and biased data. Rather than talking about what we're taking away from the web and away from the models, we have to look at what we add. The models are biased because they reflect the biases of society. And the, the power the privilege of publishing, which for centuries rested with people who look like me, old white men. And so that's why the models do what they do when it comes to presenting information. They do it from that bias. So rather than taking information away, what do we add back? What's missing there? So I think it's a public good to say that we need this technology to be workable in these ways, around equity and quality and authority. It is also a public good to have news and information that can be supported. So how do we deal with both those principles in private uh, enterprises? There have been three strategies so far. One is litigation, one is legislation, and one is collaboration. On litigation, we see the New York Times suing OpenAI. So is Alderman Global Management, which is the most obnoxious of the hedge funds that own newspapers in the US uh, through Media News Group. Um, that's litigation. Legislation, I've gone through a lot of we see happening, and there's more coming that I think is very dangerous. Um, again, two more internet freedoms. And the other is collaboration. And I see a, an island 
of enlightened collaboration going on in Norway, because hey, it's Norway. <laughs> and uh, Shipstead, which is the leading publisher there, gathered all the publishers of Norway and had them contribute all of their content to research to create a Norwegian language LLM. And they needed that to say, we need something other than just adapting English language LLMs. They all recognized they needed it. The publishers cooperated. The government said, our entire library is digitized because of Norway. And so they said, if you need help doing that, we'll figure out how to give recompense. It doesn't yet deal with business models that will come, but they collaborate. At the event I held with Common Crawl in New York a few a weeks ago, I had the editor of VG, which is the New York Times of Norway, come in. They're doing phenomenal things, trying to use AI smartly and wisely and cautiously in the newsroom and with their readers and with their business. Here, media act like they're the victim of the internet and the victim of technology. And that gets them nowhere. What we're going to see in California is if that bill passes there, Meta will take down all news in California. Google, which contributes, has pledged $300 million to news, will stop giving money voluntarily if it's forced to give money. Major operations will go away. California, of all places, should enable collaboration between journalism and technology just as we needed most as AI arrives. But instead, we're going to see a divorce there. There is a reflex to control whenever new media enable more voices to be heard. And those who controlled media before resent the new voices who arrive. We saw it with print. We saw it with radio. We've seen it with the internet. And I think that we have to recognize that this is a discussion in the end about freedom and about equity and being heard. It's also interesting that as AI arrives, there's a big discussion about responsibility. I want to just do a quick matrix here. And I find this parallel fascinating with history. There's talk now about uh, we have to make the models responsible for everything that's done with the models. And California has legislation pending right now that would make the makers of AI models sign a statement under criminal penalty of perjury that their models are safe and could not be used unsafely. Well, it's a general machine, and how can you predict every bad thing that every bad actor could ever imagine to do with it? Not even possible. I don't think the guardrails are possible. It's a general machine. So that's the high level. At the next level, there's the companies that use this. I don't know if you remember the story of Air Canada had an AI bot that ripped off a customer, and the airline tried to say, well, we didn't do it, the bot did it. No Air Canada, you're responsible. So there's that intermediary level. And then there's the user level. You all probably remember that story from more than a year ago now of the schmuck lawyer in New York who used ChatGPT to get citations for a filing he had to do. And he got caught. And I went to the federal court hearing for a show cause for contempt for this lawyer. And the lawyer was there, and he said, I didn't think the computer could lie. It was a super search engine. I didn't know. And the lawyer's lawyer, you know you're in trouble when your lawyer has to hire a lawyer. The lawyer's lawyer said to the judge, oh, thank you, Your Honor, for exposing the danger of ChatGPT to the country. And the judge interrupted him and said, uh, I've done no such thing. The problem here was not the technology. The problem here was the schmuck lawyer who didn't do his homework, didn't do his job. Humans. Well, now take that three level of the technology, the intermediary, and the user back to Gutenberg. When print started with Gutenberg, the first parties held responsible were the technologists, the printers, for what came off their presses. And if the, if the authorities, the princes, and the churches were not happy, then they got beheaded or beheaded or burned at the stake. Then it was the intermediaries, it was the publishers, the booksellers, who were held responsible. Then that didn't scale. So finally, authorities said, well, yeah, you can publish anything now, but if it's bad, it's your ass, authors. And Foucault says that's the beginning of our idea of an author, when they became responsible. So today, too, with AI, there's a, there's a reflex to control this. Something must be done. And, and, and surely we make the technology companies responsible for everything. That's naive. It would be like saying to Gutenberg, you make sure that Mark Luther can never touch this thing. Impossible. And we've got to deal with these questions about the amoral, not immoral, the amoral machine in our midst. 
how do we grapple with that? Um, so, based on the last panel, I want to mention just one thing, because agents came up a lot with Dick, is I see a new nightmare scenario here, nightmare from the media perspective, is that just as we've gone through the web and search and social and the problems of the business model we pursue online in the attention economy, we're trying to figure all that out. Now comes AI. Now comes chat and agents as new interface. And so I wonder whether, I'm not predicting this, but I wonder whether we're going to find ourselves in a place where the web as we knew it is replaced. The web is being ruined right now by spam and advertising junk and all kinds of crap being thrown in there. That's going to get worse with AI because people are going to make up all kinds of crap and they're going to spew it into the web, making it harder and harder for Google or anybody else to find the wheat from the chat. Um, and then what if we have chat interfaces and agents that are going out and getting stuff for us and going to go to the web? That does disaster to the destination strategy, the attention economy, and the subscription strategies of media companies. And media companies better start figuring out what to do. They can't just sue, and they can't just hide. And I've argued that the news industry should come up with its own API for news to make it discoverable to these companies under conditions that are negotiated and agreed upon. But instead, what we see is simply hostility or lobbying. And I don't think that's very effective. At the end, what we're going to need, this is an obvious and trite statement, but we need experimentation, research, data, transparency. We've got to recognize that these are huge and changing technologies that, yes, bring some perils, but they also bring opportunity. And I, I'm not one of those who believes that this is going to doom humanity. That's bullshit. It is from the crazy philosophies of some of these AI boys. That they, that they go after this stuff. There are real present day concerns and issues and dangers that we need to be able to talk about sanely together, about the environment, about labor, about um, um, how we use this stuff, how it's used to fool people, how it's used by malign actors. These are all important things. It's not about going to Mars. It's not about the future of humanity. It's about today's humanity. And there's tremendous value we can get from this technology, but we've got to be able to have a sane conversation about it that is informed by research and openness. So if government's going to do anything, what I hope it does is foster collaboration, foster transparency, foster research. That's what we're going to need as we experiment with these technologies. But what I also hope happens is that we don't, along the way, ruin the freedoms that the internet has brought us so that more voices can be heard today than ever were heard in the days of, and I use air quotes, mainstream mass media that was again run by people who looked like me. Now the voices who could not be heard are heard online, and I believe what happens, and I believe what led to the attack on this capital was that old forces resented those voices and didn't want them to be heard, and didn't want them heard. Just today, just last night, Dick told me, that um, under the pressure of Jim Jordan, uh, Stanford has, 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 has deprecated its uh, Internet Observatory, which does important research on these issues. Harvard has done some similar things with other efforts there. They're complicated, but, but they're gone. We can't afford to blind ourselves and, and hide our ears to what's going on. We can't afford to just have an emotional reaction to all of this. Oh my God, it's new technology. We have to recognize that we have the agency and we have the power over this. In my next book, I'll plug my own book, the way we weep, coming out in October, I argue that the internet is not a technology, it's a human network. And the, the problems of the internet are our problems. We bring, it didn't make us hate, we brought our hate to it. It didn't make us stupid. We bring our ignorance to it, especially as uh, I just saw a story this morning that states are going to put up the horrible prayer you and teach our, our, our students. That's the kind of stuff that ruins society, not the technology. It's a tool. We can use it for good, for creativity, for education, for all kinds of things. But we have to recognize it as that 
and master it as that. So I thank you for your attention, and uh, God's work if you can figure out how to make all this happen.